After all these years, I can picture that old time to myself now, just as it was then. The white town drowsing in the sunshine of a summer's morning, the streets empty or pretty nearly so, one or two clerks sitting in front of the Water Street stores with their splint bottom chairs tilted back against the wall, chins on breasts, hats slouched over their faces, asleep with shingle shavings enough around to show what broke them down. A sow and a litter of pigs loafing along the sidewalk, doing a good business in watermelon rinds and seeds. Two or three lonely little freight piles scattered about the levee. A pile of skids on the slope of the stone-paved wharf, and the fragrant town drunkard asleep in the shadow of them. Two or three wood flats at the head of the wharf, but nobody to listen to the peaceful lapping of the wavelets against them. The great Mississippi, the majestic, the magnificent Mississippi, rolling its mile-wide tide along, shining in the sun, the dense forest away on the other side, the point above the town and the point below, bounding the river glimpse and turning it into a sort of a sea, and withal a very still and brilliant and lonely one. Presently a film of dark smoke appears above one of those remote points. Instantly a negro drayman, famous for his quick eye and prodigious voice, lifts up the cry, Steamboat a-comin'! And the scene changes. The town drunkard stirs. The clerks wake up. A furious clatter of drays follows. Every house and store pours out a human contribution and in a twinkling, the dead town is alive and moving. Drays, carts, men, boys, all go hurrying from many quarters to a common center, the wharf. Assembled there, the people fasten their eyes upon the coming boat as upon a wonder they are seeing for the first time. And the boat is rather a handsome sight, too. She is long and sharp and trim and pretty. She has two tall, fancy-top chimneys, with a gilded device of some kind swung between them, a fanciful pilot house, all glass and gingerbread, perched on top of the Texas deck behind them. The paddle boxes are gorgeous with a picture or a gilded raise above the boat's name. The boiler deck, the hurricane deck, and the Texas deck are fenced and ornamented with clean white railings. There's a flag gallantly flying from the jack staff. The furnace doors are open and the fires glaring bravely. The upper decks are black with passengers. The captain stands by the big bell, calm, imposing, the envy of all. Great volumes of blackest smoke are rolling and tumbling out of the chimneys. A husbanded grandeur created with a bit of pitch pine just before arriving at a town. The crew are grouped on the forecastle. The broad stage is run far out over the port bow and an Envy Deckhand stands picturesquely on the end of it, with a coil of rope in his hands. The pent steam is screaming through the gauge cocks. The captain lifts his hand, the bell rings, the wheels stop. Then they turn back, churning the water to foam, and the steamer is at rest. Then such a scramble as there is to get aboard, and to get ashore, and to take in freight, and to discharge freight, all at one and the same time, and such a yelling and cursing as the mates facilitated all with. Ten minutes later, the steamer is under way again with no flag on the jack staff and no black smoke issuing from the chimneys. After ten more minutes, the town is dead again, and the town drunkard asleep by the skids once more.